just a little bit about me. I've been licensed and ordained uh, since 1998. Uh, from 98 through about uh, 2005, I was a short-term missionary, spending most of my trips to uh, either Burkina Faso, West Africa, or Tanzania, East Africa, um, and still have uh, several connections there that I keep in touch with daily. December, uh, December of 2010, I found myself unemployed and wasn't really sure what to do. I, I don't know if any of you have been there. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because if you're like me, that was somewhat embarrassing. And uh, so the Lord took me through a process, four and a half years of studying the book of Revelation. Uh, I think I've read every commentary there is. I think I've uh, read virtually every version of the, of the scriptures that's out from the King James to New King James to the NIV to the New Living Translation to the Message was, was quite a, a labor of love. And uh, what came out of it was a book called The Revelation Project, which is something I, uh, I self-published online through Amazon. And it sold a whopping, uh, over, over three years, it sold a whopping two copies. And uh, that was my fault. I didn't know how to promote it. And then um, two years ago, a, a publishing company got a hold of the manuscript and wanted to publish. And so uh, on August 1st of this year, uh, I, I celebrated one year of having my book actually published by somebody where the, the, uh, the manuscript was actually uh, understandable and, and grammatically correct and syntax and all of that stuff that I don't know about. And... Uh, so anyway, I had that, and then I, I have another book out that's called uh, Go There For A Guide To Short-Term Missions. That's on Amazon. Um, and then the other thing that uh, basically changed my life was I traveled for a year with a Christian band uh, at 40 years old. I, I uh, took off and traveled the United States in a 15-passenger Dodge Ram van pulling a trailer with our instruments and sound equipment, and uh, we did that for a year. We ended up in several countries. We ended up in the Philippines and India, um, Canada, um, and then uh, Burkina Faso. So during that time, it was interesting. I was 40 years old, and uh, without counting me, the average age in the band was 20. So it was... Uh, I felt like Grandpa Jeff most of the time. So, but it was awesome because we saw um, a lot of people get saved. We saw probably more than 4,000 people saved. And uh, so it was worth an hour, or an hour. <laughs> it was worth a year of my time. Amen. Uh, this morning, as I was sitting here, um, I was asking, I've been asking the Lord for confirmation about what he wanted me to say. What, what, what is it that you want me to speak? I don't want to get up here because I have nothing to offer you if it's not from the Lord. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that right now. I have nothing to offer you. I can tell you about the scriptures. I can, but as far as an anointed word, I've got nothing unless God sparks something. I, I hadn't received a confirmation until this morning until I was sitting right here. And uh, the, the opening scripture that you read that was out of James. And uh, couldn't have picked a more perfect scripture. I mean, not if you would have tried, Scott. So I want to start this morning, and I, and I want to start with something that I think everyone here would know. I would like for you to recite the Lord's Prayer with me. Can we do that? And as you are speaking the Lord's Prayer, I want you to listen. I want you to listen because that's a key to what I'm going to talk about today. So let's, let's, let's raise our voices, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive the debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, this probably didn't work the way I wanted it to because I'm guessing that most of you have been in this congregation for a while. True? And so you're used to, when that, com when that prayer comes up, you're used to reciting it, and you're all probably saying the same thing. But as I go through Scripture, I'm finding out that it's not the same in, any, in every Bible. In fact, it's not the same within each Bible. When you, and you can check this, you can check me on this. Um, one of my favorite books in the New Testament, or what I call the Revealed Covenant, is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And you'll find this prayer in the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And you'll also find it in the book of Luke, and I believe it's chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. But even if you compare what Matthew has written and what Luke has written, they're two different, I mean, the words are not the same. And me, as a studier, as someone that reads the Word of God, and I want to know what it's saying. I want to, I'm a lot like Scott in the sense that I see something, I'm a pit bull, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock my teeth into something until I understand what's going on. And so this was just really driving me crazy, I, you know. Um, and as I'm reading the book of Matthew, I start doing some study, and I'm starting to learn other things as well. I'm starting to learn, first of all, that the book of Matthew was not written originally in Greek. It was written in Hebrew, which was so against everything I've ever been taught. And so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, well, if it was written in Hebrew, I want to know what the Hebrew says. And I don't speak Hebrew. I don't understand Hebrew. So I had to find a mentor. And it was interesting because I have a mentor that doesn't even know who I am. I've, yeah, I know, I see the looks. This guy's Looney Tunes already. <laughs> but uh, I found, uh, what, I, what I found was this. Uh, because of my insatiable appetite for our heritage and for um, wanting to know what's really going on, uh, I, I, I knew that I desperately needed somebody that had an understanding of Hebrew and that could relate it to me in English. And so I ran into, uh, I found the name of a person that uh, grew up in Chicago as an Orthodox Jew. His father was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. So I think he understands the traditions of the, of the Jewish people. His name is uh, Nehemia Gordon, and uh, his qualification for mentoring me is that he is on the team that, disciple, or that deciphers the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I think he's got a little bit of knowledge there. Uh, what I found then in reading some of his documentation, reading some of his books, was that when you get into the Hebrew and you start understanding what the literal translation is, there is so much more depth. There's, there's so much meaning that through translation gets lost. And by that I mean most everything was written in Hebrew first. Then it was translated into Greek, was translated from the Greek into Latin, was translated from Latin into English. Now, how many of you know when you go from language to language, you're going to lose some meaning? You might have a word or two that doesn't match up with anything that's in the new language or the, the one that you're transcribing to. And so I, this was my driving force for wanting to know more. I, I was sitting there actually asking myself, what did Jesus teach his disciples? What was the meaning that he was teaching? Um, how many of you have seen the, the movie or the shows called The Chosen? Have any of you seen those? They do a wonderful job with, with this particular aspect. One of the things that the disciples did is they came to Jesus and they said, teach us how to pray. What are you saying when you go off for hours or days on end by yourself? You tell us you're praying, but what are you saying? Teach us to pray. We want to pray like you pray. And, and that really affected me. It infected me. I, because I want that same heart. I want to know what Jesus, the Son of God, is saying to his Father. 
If it's good enough for Jesus, it's got to be good enough for me and you. Amen? So I started with the Lord's Prayer. And first of all, in Hebrew, it's called the Avinu Prayer, which literally translated as Our Father. And it goes like this. It says, Our Father in heaven, may your name be sanctified, and may your kingdom be blessed. Your will shall be done on earth, or on, your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. Give us our bread continually or daily. And forgive the debt of our sin as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Do not bring us into the hands of a test and keep us from all evil. Amen. And as, as Americans, we're saying, wait a minute, that's not the end. Right? What happened to, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, what I found was that was added by a Christian scribe, by a believing scribe, much later in time. And as you check your Bibles, you'll see that in Matthew, that phrase is, is added. But in Luke, it's not. Again, I'm thinking, what is going on here? But it was the last sentence that grabbed me. It was, the, it was the part that says, do not bring us into the hands of a test. You know, we say, do not lead us into temptation. Well, first of all, God can't be tempted, and, and the scripture says that he tempts nobody. So there's a conflict there. Do not bring us into the hands of a test. I had to understand what that meant. And literally, according to Nehemiah Gordon, literally what this means is don't let us fail the tests that we encounter. Don't let us fall into shame because we failed. And even more specifically, don't let us bring shame on you because we failed the test. It's here where I had to, to remember that when Father God tests us, because he does test us. He doesn't tempt us, but he tests us. And the testing is not for his benefit. The testing is for our benefit so that we will understand the true love that we have for him or where our level of love for him rests. The Lord took me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'm going to read the first uh, nine verses. It's, and this is Moses speaking. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. How many of us are crossing over to possess a land? Every hand should be up. We are crossing over from this life into the spiritual life into eternity, right? Right? So we're all crossing over. That you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you, your son, and your grandson, in other words, every generation that you can touch in your family, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it. How many are in the family of Israel? Again, we should all raise our hands because we're part of spiritual Israel if we're born again. And that you may, be, or that you may greatly multiply as the Lord, your God, or the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And here's the commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. David said, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand 
and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. As I went through that, there was a word there that I didn't know. Frontlet. I didn't know what frontlet meant. So I went to the Strong's Concordance. I mean, that's Strong's, uh, James Strong and I have become good friends over the years. Uh, his book has been amazing. Uh, according to Strong's Concordance, it's, it's uh, H2902, for those of you that are studiers, and it means bands or phylacteries or marks or markers. And by the way, a, a frontlet is your forehead. So you bind them on your forehead between your eyes. What is, what is he talking about? In our mind, right? So not only did the... <laughs> not, I'm sorry, I, I just touched my screen like I have a touch screen and I could scroll up. Okay, pray for me. Uh, not only did Father God command, uh, uh, command them to keep the statutes, he told them how to keep them. He, uh, today, Orthodox Jews wear what's called a phylactery. It's a, a leather box th with a strap, and it says to wear it on your hand. The literal Hebrew is left hand when you, when you look at the definition. And so they wear it around their wrist, which is considered, in, in the, to a Jew, your wrist is still part of your hand. Okay? So they're saying, on your hand, or they'll wear it around, a strap around their head, and, and there'll be a box sitting on their forehead, and it contains scriptures. Now, how that's supposed to go from the box into your brain, I have no idea. Okay? I praise God I don't have to wear a phylactery. But I do have a brain, and I'm supposed to train it. Right? Train up a child in the ways they should go, and when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Memorization. So throughout the concealed covenant, God has, and, and I'm going with the word marker, okay? I, I know it said bands, it said phylacteries, it said frontlets, but a marker, a marker. And all throughout the concealed covenant, and, and let me explain something. I've gotten to the point where I don't see a difference between the, what you guys call the Old and New covenant, or Testaments. To me, it's one big story. And so I call it the Concealed Covenant because Christ was concealed up until the book of Matthew, and then he's revealed from Matthew through Revelation. So when I say Concealed Covenant, just you'll know where I'm, where I'm at. But all throughout the Concealed Covenant, people were commanded to make boundary stones or memorial stones or to build altars because of what God has done for them. Okay? Um, you know, he said, put boundary stones around the mountains so that nobody will pass that because if they do, they will surely die. Memorial stones, remember what I've done for you. Altars because of the things that, the miracles that were done. And so, as I'm, as I'm conversing with the Lord in my private time, he, it was like he was asking me, where are, Jeff, where are your memorial stones? What are you doing? Where, where are your markers? And I have to admit, I was dumbfounded. That happens a lot to me, by the way. But I was dumbfounded. I wasn't really sure. And how many times has God asked you a question and you're afraid to answer? You know the answer, but just because you read the scripture like, you, you know, I'm not saying a word. I'm going to let him just tell me. And that's where I was at. But in essence, what he was asking me, where are the things that remind you of what I have brought you through? So again, let me revisit that last sentence of the Avenue Prayer. Do not bring us into the hands of a test. It's not the test that we should worry about. It's the shame of failing, both for us personally and for the name of the Lord and his kingdom. So right now, just I want to take a few minutes, and I'm going to tell you about a few of my boundary stones, or my, my memorial stones, my markers, if you will. 
This past Tuesday, I turned 65 years old. And in August 16th of 1957, I was born in Buena Vista County Hospital, Storm Lake, Iowa. And during that week, I received my first marker. Obviously, I'm too young to remember, so I'm going, I'm trusting the memory of my now deceased mother, so I have no way to validate it. I've called the hospital to ask for records, and they laughed at me because we burn all those records once you turn 21. I have no way, no way else to validate this. But according to my mother, she said, I was in the hospital, I had been born and had such a severe case of eczema that they couldn't, that I had to be fed intravenously. And back in the late 50s, early 60s, they would do that through an IV in your skull. Well, somebody wasn't paying attention because I ended up with a, the, the, the IV popped the vein and I ended up with a big bubble of fluid on my, on my skull, on, my, on the back of my head. And if you, if, if you recall uh, newborns, they're, our skulls are not completely formed yet. They're still soft, right? For the first, I don't know, couple months. I, I don't know the technicality of that. But they got, got it under control, and they changed that. There was an area that they, they uh, sliced my left ankle, for whatever reason. Um, but put the, I guess they wanted to make sure the tube wasn't going to come out again. Okay, so I have two markers on my body. First of all, if afterwards, if you want to come up and rub the back of my head, it's flat. <laughs> okay, I, I may be making too much fun of this, but I have a flat spot on the back of my head. It's not from disobedience and my wife hitting me with a cast iron skillet. It's been there since my first week of life. The second is, is I still, well, let me ask you this. How long does it take for a scar to go away once you've had stitches? Usually, if they're good at what they do, they go, it, it disappears in a year or two, right? I still have the stitching scar 65 years later. I have markers in my life that when I go through tough times, all I have to do is this. Oh, God, you are so good to me. You've seen me through. And what I'm facing right now doesn't look possible, but I know you've got me. I know you've got me. Summer of 1992 and 1993, I was a wild child at that point, and the Lord saved me twice, once each summer. I was, uh, without giving very much credit to the enemy, I was uh, involved in a lot of alcoholic beverages, and I had fallen asleep uh, on my back and vomited. And those of you that are of my generation remember that there was a man named Jimi Hendrix that that happened to and he choked and died. Well, I wasn't smart enough to, to quit drinking the first time. It happened again the next summer. And there's a marker there. It's, it's not a physical marker. It's a, it's a mental scar. And it was a wake-up call. That was, that was the end of my drinking days. And then there's one other that I'll share, and that just happened a couple months ago. Uh, June, uh, June 13th, I suffered a gallbladder attack. And on the 15th of June, they took my gallbladder through emergency surgery. I now walk around with a 10-inch zipper scar on my stomach because they stapled it shut. And, and so I'll, and there's a ridge there. I can feel it through my shirt. So if this, if this isn't working, this does. But they're markers. Because in that hospital bed, my wife was out of town. Couldn't come and see me. I received, and I've already talked to the pastor, so he knows this is not a criticism. I received no pastoral visits. I was lonely. But God met me there. He met me while I was in that hospital bed. In fact, the first night I was there, at 4 o'clock in the morning, the, the night nurse walked into my room to check on me, and I was awake. Find out she was a born-again Christian, and, and we proceeded to have church in the hospital room. The goodness of God, he was watching over me. 
He was watching over me. And I can't tell you how many times I, I heard God speak to my heart. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I know what I heard in my heart. And he was there. And I know this isn't just something I'm making up, because my good friend was just here a couple weeks ago, uh, Don Bettis, stood in this very pulpit, and he talked to you about the things he had been through. He now walks with a physical marker because of the stroke he had. He is not the same person. He was vibrant. He was uh, animated. Uh, very musical. And he went through a time where he couldn't even hold his guitar pick. He couldn't form the chords in his left hand. But God has brought him through. And now he's playing music again. And he stood here and sang you a song. I watched the video. So I know this is real. I know this is real. And since becoming aware of memorial stones, I'm continually reminded that how Father God knows so much more about what he has intended for me than what I could ever come up with myself. I didn't know about these situations, but he did. Starting from when I was a week old. He knew the plans he had for me, and he knows of the plans he still has for me. And this is more than just a testimony. Again, I can show the marks on my body for those that need, for, for those of you from Missouri, let me put it that way. You see, we all go through tests. The Avenue Prayer doesn't say keep us from tests. It specifically says keep us from failing those tests. And it, the reason that it talks about that is because you can't have a testimony without a test. You've probably heard that before. If you don't have a test, if you don't have a test and pass the test, you don't have a testimony. And when that time comes to share that testimony, what do we say? You ever, you ever find that? You, you got a chance to witness to somebody and you're, you get caught in mouth. All of a sudden your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth and you just really don't know what to say. Is that, am I the only one that happens to? Let me, allow me to define what the elements of a proper testimony include. First of all, it's got to be relieving or lending aid or support. The second thing is it's got to be uh, pertinent, excuse me, or applicable. And the third thing, it's got to be sufficient to support the cause. Does that make sense? It's got to be relieving or lending aid or support to whoever you're talking to. It's got to be pertinent or applicable to their situation. And it must be sufficient to support the cause. So in other words, a relevant gospel message or a relevant gospel testimony is one that's relieving, pertinent, and applicable to the people we're dealing with and sufficient to support the cause of Christ. But let, and let me tell you, let me, let me just caution you. The same testimony is not good for everybody. Our lives are multifaceted. We go through many tests. We learn many lessons. And so we have to be listening for the right testimony for the right person. We can't just lock in one and think it's going to be good for everybody. He is expanding our reach with every test that we go through. He's providing us with a testimony that accompanies that test. And I didn't really tell you the name of my message this morning. The name of the message is, what's your story? And that's my question to you right now. What is your story? I've shared some of mine, but what's your story? You see, you have to give it thought. There are people that are waiting out there to hear from you. Each one of us 
You can reach people that I'll never be able to reach. I can reach people that you'll never see or be able to talk to. Together, we will reach people that will never darken the doors of this place or any church. There are situations that we encounter and that we've prevailed in that have provided us with the exact words that someone else needs to hear. We all have a job to do. We all have a testimony. And, it's all, and we all have people that we need to touch. We need to reach out to. I know this isn't a fun message, but it's the one God placed in my heart and was confirmed this morning. It's my belief that the reason the kingdom of God is not advancing like it should in this country is because we are not opening our mouths. We're not touching those people that need to hear us. We're not trusting enough in the Lord to just go therefore, if I can put it that way. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It's not abounding in this country because one, we're either not passing the tests or two, when we pass the test, we put them behind us and don't offer the testimony that we receive to others. See, let me just appeal to every one of you. It doesn't matter how old you are. Kids, it doesn't matter how young you think you are. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't really matter if you're popular or if you're the quiet one in the crowd. Okay? It doesn't matter if you're the, the uh, great, uh, you know, if you're the, the senior physician at a hospital or the custodian. It doesn't matter. God is no respecter of people in that, in that regard. Our testimony is not for us to keep to ourselves. It mimics salvation. Now check this out. Our testimonies mimic salvation in the sense that it's given to us not to hoard, but to share. Christ is our example. He came with salvation, but he freely gave it away on the cross to each one of us. And that's the same with our testimony. Oftentimes, our testimony will end up being used by the Holy Spirit to lead others to the foot of the cross and to salvation, and we won't even know it. Paul writes in one of his epistles, he says, some plant and some, some harvest. And others, we, we just tend the garden. But, but it all is a work of, of God. It's all under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking, what's your story? I know that each one of us have at least one or two because our lives are in fact multifaceted and we face a whole lot of tests. I've heard it described as our lives can be like an onion. You just peel one layer off at a time and there's still more. It just keeps going. What's your story? If you're not sure, it's time. It's time that you figure it out. The time is short. I know we hear this all the time. But truly, let's look around. There was a reason I didn't talk about Revelation this morning, because you'd be good for about another hour or so. I can't talk about Revelation without going an hour, hour and a half, two hours. I mean, it just it's in me. I can't help it. But the time is short, and when we look around, we know that. We see things that just don't make sense. For those of us that are baby boomers and older, life is not like what we grew up with. It's not the same. Kids are not playing out in, out in, the, out in the, you know, I, I'm going to say out in the streets, you know what I mean, in yards, and, you know, they're not getting together and playing football or baseball. They're playing football or baseball. 
like this. One, because that's the sign of the, you know, that's what they do now, but the other is because we can't afford to let our kids out and be unattended because there are people that will take advantage of that. The times have changed. We need to pray and ask for assistance from the Holy Spirit to lead us into the truth of our experiences and our story. We all have one, one part of our story that's the same. If you're born again, you have a Savior that came and set you free. All you have to do is accept it. But then there's a responsibility that goes with it. It's free, but it's not cheap. What's your story? There are people waiting to hear from you. Perhaps this is a test that you're being faced with. But now is the time for you to pray, Abba, Father, do not bring me into the hands of a test. Now is the time for victory, and the time is short. What's your story? Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you for these people. They're so awesome. I thank you for this church. I thank you, Father, that you have given us time in your presence. You extend your almighty right hand. Father, each and every day you meet with us. You desire to meet with us. And those of us that are diligent, we hear your voice. Father, we thank you. I ask that you would bless each and every one that's here today, Father, that you would bring them back again tonight for their evening service, that you would continue to work in their lives, Lord, that you would bless them with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Again, thank you, Father, for allowing me to try and, and unravel your word. And we thank you, Father, for all of the tests. We thank you that for the blessing of passing those tests, and we ask for another chance for those tests that we've failed. Help us to reach out and touch others, Father, for your kingdom. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.